Well, hello everyone and welcome to the 2021 Shoreline Management Webinar Series hosted by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and the VIM Center for Coastal Resources Management. My name is Karen During. I'm today's webinar host. My co-host today is Susanna Music, also from VIMS. The Virginia Institute of Marine Science hosts annual workshops for the shoreline management community with funding support from NOAA and the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. The topic for today's webinar is integrated shoreline management with dis discussions about new guidelines and regulation changes that incorporate sea level rise and climate change into the management of tidal shorelines in Virginia. Today's program includes an impressive interagency team of six representatives from Virginia's tidal shoreline regulatory agencies and their scientific and legal advisors. Randy Owen and Rachel Peabody will represent the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, or VMRC. Dr. Mark Lukenbach from VIMS will join Rachel in a joint presentation about VMRC's recently updated tidal wetlands guidelines. All three of them will answer questions together at the end of their joint presentation. The next speaker will be Justin Williams with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality or DEQ. Justin will talk about new amendments to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act that applies to the upland riparian buffer area adjacent to tidal shorelines. Then Pam Mason from VIMS and Elizabeth Andrews with the Virginia Coastal Policy Center will talk about guidelines and modeling currently in progress to support VMRC, DEQ, and Virginia's local governments with implementation of the new integrated shoreline management programs that address climate change and sea level rise adaptations. Now I'd like to introduce our first group of panelists. Randy Owen is the Chief of Habitat Management at the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. Randy has been with the agency since 1988. Randy and his staff are responsible for Virginia's regulatory program governing state-owned submerged lands, tidal wetlands, beaches, and coastal primary sand dunes. Assisting Randy today is Rachel Peabody, who is the new Senior Advisor for Coastal Adaptation and Ecosystem Restoration at VMRC. She serves as the Chief Science and Policy Advisor on Climate Change, Coastal Resilience, and habitat restoration, representing her agency on several state and regional advisory committees and policy teams. Rachel will review the new tidal wetlands guidelines that became effective in May of this year. Rachel will be joined by Dr. Mark Lukenbach, who is the Associate Dean of Research and Advisory Services and a professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Mark's staff is responsible for coordinating all state mandated research and outreach activities at VIMS which includes serving as Virginia's science advisor on coastal and marine related issues. Mark is going to speak today about the VIMS role as best available science advisor for the new tidal wetland guidelines. So Rachel, if you're ready, you can start sharing your screen. Hi everyone, um, I'm Rachel Peabody and Karen gave me um, or gave you all a great explanation of my new position here at the VMRC where um, we're focusing on coastal adaptation, ecosystem uh, restoration, and just coastal zone management holistically. Um, and I'm here to update you on our tidal wetlands um, guidelines that were updated in May of this year. So for this discussion, I'm gonna be talking specifically about the wetlands jurisdiction um, in Virginia, which is defined as uh, mean low water to mean high water when there's no vegetation and mean low water to one and a half mean, um, one and a half times the mean tide range when there is vegetation. Um, and then Justin, who's gonna follow me, will be talking about the Chesapeake Bay program area, um, which is just landward um, of our jurisdiction. But of course, these are all integral parts of the coastal zone and um, why we're integrating a lot of our guidance. <clears throat> so um, Virginia has been managing tidal wetlands um, through the local wetlands board process since 1972. Um, and in this process, uh, the Code of Virginia establishes a model ordinance 
Um, and localities have the option of um, adopting that model ordinance and managing tidal wetlands in their locality through the wetlands board process. And since 1972, it has been the main goal of our wetlands boards to um, preserve wetlands and to prevent their disfoliation and destruction and to accommodate necessary economic development in a manner consistent with wetlands preservation. Um, small changes have obviously happened um, to the wetland ordinance since 1972, but one of the most recent and major updates to that was the incorporation of the concept of living shorelines, which was um, passed in 2011 through Senate Bill 964. And in this bill, it established the uh, definition that you see here on the screen of a living shoreline, but also established that living shorelines were the preferred method for shoreline stabilization. And then in 2020, um, we had the biggest update we've seen, um, which was Senate Bill 776. Um, this had some major goals within that bill. One was it strengthened the concept of living shorelines in um, wetland management. So it established living shorelines as the default approach to shoreline control, unless the best available science indicates that the site is not suitable for such methods. It also starts to uh, consider um, sea level rise and coastal habitats and how to protect our wetland resources in light of those um, future and existing problems. And then um, it asked that the DEQ and the um, VMRC begin to develop integrated guidance for the management of shoreline systems as a whole um, to coordinate permit decisions and um, to uh, make the system a little bit more fluid as one walks their permits through each um, regulatory division. So in 2020, the VMRC started our public outreach for building these guidelines. Um, we met with the Virginia Institute of Marine Science who gathered an inter interdisciplinary team and really focused on what have we learned since, 1997, or since 1972 on the best available science of actually managing tidal wetlands. Um, and then we also um, held a series of public workshops in 2020 and um, received a number of comments and discussions. And we used those to develop our first draft of the guidelines. The first draft of the guidelines um, were brought in front of the commission and out for public comment. And through the public comment process, we received 130 total comments. You can see kind of the breakdown of what happened there. Um, and some, some really major changes happened between the initial draft um, and the final draft that was approved by the commission in May of 2021. So here are the major changes that we see in the guidelines now compared to um, what we had prior to May of 2021. They've been updated um, through the co consultation with VIMS on the best available science. They communicate that living shorelines are the default approach to shoreline stabilization. They ensure protection of shoreline resources from sea level rise and climate change. And when living shorelines um, are not suitable at a site, they identify preferred shoreline management approaches. So we'll start with the best available science in identifying wetlands. So one of the major changes in the 1972 document, uh, tidal wetlands were defined based off of a vegetation type, which we know change based off of the salinity in the tidal regime. Um, but we now know that each part of a tidal wetland um, is an integral puzzle piece in the entire system. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, each one should be treated as an important part. So we have simplified the wetlands types by um, defining tidal wetlands as non-vegetated wetlands and vegetated wetlands. And in non-vegetated wetlands, we have soft sediments and hard substrates. And we have regularly flooded vegetated wetlands, which are your, um, your spart spartina marshes, and you have your irregularly flooded, which are from about mean high water to one and a half times tide range and tend to be your patents and um, saltbush lines. So it also updated the general criteria for project review based off of this concept of um, each part of the tidal wetland being an integral piece. So now it tells the wetlands reviewers that 
provided that marine fisheries, fish habitat, wildlife resources, flood protection, and water quality are not detrimentally affected, and the proposed use does not contribute to the cumulative net loss of tidal wetlands, a project can be approved. It also states that the primary goal of any permit review is to minimize the loss of wetlands and the adverse ecological effect, effects of all permitted activities within those wetlands. And it strengthens the concept of living shorelines. Um, so it gives us a nice step-by-step -step approach here where it says when reviewing a project or even deciding what to do with your shoreline, first start with a living shoreline. So a living shoreline must be the primary approach to shoreline management unless the base best available science proves one is not suitable. And I'll discuss best available science um, in the next screen. And then Dr. Lukenbach is also here to discuss that. Then it says, that if the best available science says a living shoreline is not suitable, a rock revetment is the, is the next preferred method. And if a rock revetment is the um, process that you use, um, living shoreline approaches should be incorporated where possible. So is there a place where a revetment can turn into a sill and some planting can be done? Can planting be planted landward or seaward? Um, so wherever possible, we, the, the guidelines try and push us towards adding some green elements um, to the shoreline. It also introduces a number of new um, concepts for determining living shoreline suitability. And when I say new, um, new as in written to the guidelines. And, and suitability is going to be very specific to the project location. So um, here's kind of a list of some of the suitability standards that are placed in the guidelines, uh, hydrodynamics, water depth, sediment type, um, it, neighboring properties, it says to account for upland structures. Um, there's a number of things to look for and Pam is, is going to be presenting um, some of the tools that can be used for a suitability analysis. Uh, but one of my favorite papers to go to when I'm looking at designing a living shoreline or reviewing a living shoreline um, is in the Living Shorelines book that was um, published in 2017 by Donna Vilkovic et al. And it's a paper called Practical Living Shorelines Tailored to Fit in the Chesapeake Bay by Walter Priest. And this takes a lot of the terms that you see, this paper takes a lot of the terms that you see on this PowerPoint and gives a nice, um, layman's term way of reviewing them and determining if a, a shoreline is good there. There's also a number of other options, um, a host of options for tools to use when determining suitability. So the guidelines actually, the guidelines give a list. Um, so the first one that can be used is VMRC's Habitat Engineers. These are our wetlands professionals that um, their job is to help localities work through the wetlands permitting process help homeowners also do the same so they can be used for project assistance. If it's um, trying to determine um, um, if you have a tidal wetland, uh, what might be the best suitable option at your property. Um, Department of Conservation and Recreation has a shoreline erosion advisory service and they will come out to your shoreline or to a shoreline and will write a written report on what they recommend for um, maintaining the shorelines along your property. There's some really cool tools that VIMS has been producing lately. Um, VIMS and the Coast Center for Coastal Resource Management, uh, digital support tools. There's a really nice um, decision tree flow tool that, that was established last year. It's a really great place to start and asks you all of the questions and, and walks you through the process of how to ask those questions to get started with determining suitability. And after you get through all of those processes and you still, you can't decide if a project is suitable or not suitable. Um, we have the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences Office of Research and Advisory Services, um, who are specifically our um, advisors for um, deciding suitability and the best available science uh, for wetlands management. The Office of Research and Advisory Services is a small group, so they do um, they will take requests. Um, sometimes they have to triage those requests to decide where um, time is best spent. And if a request comes to their office, they're most likely going to ask, did you go through these other tools um, prior to coming to them so that they can um, they can spend their time wisely? Uh, Rachel, I think, you, uh, first of all, thanks for, for a, a great job.
introducing that. I'll be brief in, in, in a lot of ways and save a lot of my time for answering questions that people may have. Let me I'll start with a few things. Um, you know, this notion that VIMS is the best available science, uh, it's stated in the wetlands guidelines. I, I don't think any of us think that means we're the only experts, that the only science that matters comes from us. It's at some point, someone uh, has to, some entity needs to be sort of the, the final advisor to, to the state on that. And we, we certainly plan and hope to take, um, as we've done in the past, to take, to take all the information that, that's available to us and, and include it. Um, I, I, I wanna address also maybe briefly that make it clear that the guidelines to me make it clear that in judging whether a living shoreline is suitable for a particular erosion control project is not the same as determining if it is achievable from an engineering perspective. The guidelines clearly state that compliance with the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, local ordinances is required, as well as consideration of impacts on adjacent properties and habitats, including uh, riparian vegetation, submerged aquatic vegetation, and, and, and you know, oyster reefs and other, and other submerged habitats. And so we feel that it's our job uh, when, 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 you, when you come to VIMS, and maybe you've gone through the decision support tool and, and, and it, it certainly looks like a place that might be suitable or might not be suitable, but it, you've got some questions about it. Um, we feel that our job um, in, in the Office of Research and Advisory Services is to be able to bring together whatever on that particular project, whatever expertise may be needed from VIMS and to provide the comments that help evaluate some of these. So for instance, this issue about impacts on submerged aquatic vegetation, um, you know, there, or, or impacts on adjacent or uplands and, and adjacent properties. You know, we're, we're going to clearly run into situations and we already have in which what the science can tell us is and what we can bring to the table is if you do this, um, maybe you can control your erosion this way, but it will have these other impacts, maybe on on submerged aquatic vegetation, maybe on adjacent properties and habitats. Uh, rarely do, do any of these projects not have some impacts or, or some consequences for other adjacent habitats. And, and, and frankly, there, there come, there's gonna come a, a place in some of these projects where the balancing and the evaluation of those other impacts um, that, that we'll provide the science guidance for is, is really a determination of the permitting body, the Wetlands Board or the, or the, the, the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. Um, we do intend to, uh, to try to do our advisory in this area the same way we've always done it, uh, and our office has been involved, which is to look across the suite of adjacent habitats that we realize are uh, there's multiple jurisdictions. Ra Rachel mentioned that uh, in, in her talk, and particularly because of the way the guidelines are framed and, and provide as much as we can of a holistic picture of what a particular uh, project would would do in in that case to not only the the jurisdictional wetlands if we're talking about what a wetlands board might be deciding on but to sub adjacent subaqueous environments and 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 uh, adjacent upland environments um, with respect to the i think the way rachel led into this is is when and how do does does my office become involved um, in, in many cases, it's been because the, um, the VMRC engineer has asked us, the wetlands staff has asked us. Uh, sometimes we'll get a direct inquiry initially from a private landowner, but in that case, our, our first line of response will be, have you gone back and done these other steps that, that, uh, that show up earlier in um, in Karen's slide here, I mean, in Rachel's slide here, um, because th those are clearly the places to start. And it's simply when we need to corral and bring in more, more broad-based expertise from VIMS that, um, that we generally see our office being involved 
And for the most part, I think th that's a situation that the, that the VMRC engineers and the wetlands board staff recognize. I think that's all I have for now. Thanks, Mark. I'll um, keep going with just a few slides to finish off some of the updates here. And then Mark and Randy and I will be available for questions related to this. So not only do the guidelines also um, strengthen the concept of living shorelines as um, the preferred method, but also start to contemplate on how to manage wetlands in the light of sea level rise um, and climate change. And also how do we manage that in a way that uh, incorporates other, that, that is consistent between jurisdictions. And there's this nice figure here that kind of shows why this concept is important. So you can see in, in this picture, uh, 1970 um, mean low water um, between 1970 and 2016 raised about a foot. And we know that tidal wetlands be, uh, grow based off of the vegetation and, and where they are in the tidal range. And that to adapt to sea level rise, they're, they're going to need somewhere to move landward. Um, so the goal of the guidelines is that in cases where it is suitable to allow um, wetlands to move landward, that we try and incorporate that into the design. Um, one of the ways that um, that is done through the guidelines is it says the RPA must also um, review the project. Um, or if there's an impact in the RPA, it must be reviewed through the CBPA process. And Justin's going to talk more about how that happens. Um, it also start. It also says that project review of wetlands shall include a 10-year storm event um, water levels from NOAA or FEMA. And I have some, um, I have some links in my presentation of where that can be found. And I know Pam can also um, will also cover that. It also says that uh, proposed projects must allow the landward migration of existing vegetation over the useful life of the project, which is defined in the guidelines. Um, using the 2017 NOAA intermediate high projection curve. So that sounds a little bit scary, um, but it's not, it, it's not as scary once you get comfortable with um, how, to, how to use ADAPT Virginia. So here is a, um, just a sample of the ADAPT Virginia website where I'm looking at a location in Isle of Wight County and I wanna see what the 2017 curve says um, sea level rise will be. And so, um, you pick a location and it gives a nice little box and also shows you a visual of where the water levels will be. So you can see in the box that between 2010 and 2050, um, sea level rise will be about 1.5 feet and then shows based off of um, elevations and where that water will be between those years. Um, so that's a great place to start. There's, I also have some links um, in this presentation that show another calculator by the US Army Corps of Engineers that can give you the same information. Um, and these are new concepts and uh, how these are gonna be, how they're gonna be applied it has, not, um, has not been perfected yet, um, but the, the start is, is let's discuss applying them and let's try and start reviewing um, our projects with these concepts in mind so that we can get better at this process as, as we move forward. Um, so what's next? Um, we plan to update the joint permit application um, so that both the um, JPA as well as the RPA, those, those questions can lead the user in the right direction. So we're making sure we're getting the answers to the questions that the guidelines say we need to get. Um, our habitat engineers will also be um, presenting this information to the local wetlands boards um, so that we have a consistent message uh, along the state. And then um, continued and strengthened partnership between um, DEQ and the managers of the CBPA and VMRC on what integrated guidance means and how do we best um, simplify the process between the, the two agencies. Um, so that is everything I have. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rachel. And um, Randy, if you don't mind joining Yep, I'm here. And Mark, thank you. So one of the, the first questions that came in is, when will these changes be adopted or implemented? I'll start with that. Um, so these, these guidelines were already implemented. Um, these were established um, and approved through the commission in May of 2021. 
and um, our wetlands boards are already using them. So um, May of 2021. So they already are in place. They're being implemented right now. Yes, ma'am. Another question is, how is the useful life of a project defined or determined? Well, the, the useful life is essentially an engineering question. We, we discussed this at length with VEMS. It's not a science-based question. And, you, you know, Rachel did a great job of showing you the, the, um, the ADAPT Virginia. And you need to look at how long that shoreline is going to be able to, to sustain a living shoreline. And the useful life, we don't want to um, exclude the potential for living shoreline just because that shoreline may go into water in the next 15 years. You need to look at how the project can be designed to not only accommodate the, the needs for the home water to you know, stop the erosion, but you need to be looking at uh, how the shoreline can accommodate future uh, land or migration of wetlands. And, it, and of course, it has to be able to, to function to continue to protect the property. Uh, Randy, can I add to that a little bit? Absolutely. I, I think I, I agree completely with what, what Randy said. And, you know, there are going to be situations where it might match the, the, the graphic that Rachel showed. And, and either with no grading or maybe some reasonable amount of grading, you can, you can evaluate, you can, you can imagine how that, or evaluate how, what the useful life of that project is gonna be as it, as it can migrate. There are gonna be other situations where a living shoreline is perfectly feasible, suitable now, but the reality of what's behind it in terms of the slope, reasons that you may not be able to grade it uh, to, to a, uh, an elevation that would allow the, the, the continuous migration of that wetland, um, it just it, it's, it becomes important to help define what that suitable life is. As Randy says, if it's only 15 years, let's make sure we know it up front. And pretty straightforwardly, we'll use the elevation, existing elevation or the elevation that it can be modified to, and the projected rate of sea level rise. Uh, and, and I don't see the useful life as something that stops a project, but at least it clearly defines what that useful life is. Another question that we have um, is for Rachel and Randy, the landward migration over the useful life based on the NOAA intermediate high curve may be the most important and least understood piece of this. So how will this be required in the joint permit application? Is this a, um, is this a something like is going to be required for a complete application if it's not included or incorporated in the design? Is that going to be something that's a red flag for the permit application process? I think is what this question is asking. I think the short answer is yes, but the I'll let you know, Rachel, you want to start, I'll come in behind her. Okay. Um, so, and I see there's a number of questions about the updates to the JPA and making sure that we have um, public input. And, and so, Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we will be doing is asking people, what do you what do you need in the JPA to make this process easier for you as the applicant as well as as the permit reviewer? So um, that will be that will be a process that we go through in order to make this easier for everybody. Um, but also, yes, the, the guidelines now say that it has to be has to be considered. Um, and so if it's not considered, one one could say that the um, application is not complete. And then another question, um, how do these regulations link to floodplain management? Well, I, I don't know that we, that's more of a DCR question. The, um, you know, the, the limits of the wetlands board is at one and a half times the tide range. And uh, when, you, when you start talking about floodplains, I, I'm thinking higher than that from what I think the question is asking. So um, I don't know, Rachel or Mark may want to, respond to that as well. As far as floodplain management, you know, living shorelines are a BMP, uh, best management practice for, for flood management. So in that way, we're trying to incorporate best management practices through the entire shoreline review process. Um, however, there's still a lot of linkages for the future that, that we need to make when it comes to managing our coastal shorelines um, with sea level rise, uh, knowing that the floodplain is going to change. <laughs> 
Yes, and I think that this is one of the burdens that falls to the local governments to integrate these programs further within their jurisdictions amongst the different programs with their floodplain managers and, and having local level coordination. But there is nothing specifically in the guidelines that addresses the floodplain management ordinances in Virginia, if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, Pam, Pam is clarifying that there is a lot of overlap with tidal flooding and the FEMA floodplain geographically, and that some of the tools that Rachel mentioned in our ADAPT VA portal, the mapping viewer does allow you to see the overlap of where tidal flooding and the FEMA floodplain may co-occur. Um, another question sort of about the process, the permit application process is, um, what is the test of whether an applicant has used best available science or not to determine the applicability of living shorelines in their project? Well, I'll, I'll jump in there. I, I think a first cut is that they've gone through the decision tree and utilize the tools that, that is on CCRM's website, uh, or possibly that 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 the um, that they've you know they've, they've incorporated advice that the um, first cut that the habitat engineers have recommended that they uh, maybe they've got a report from C's that they've utilized those. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some questions that come up. Uh, and particularly in con concern about, well, like I said, well, from an, you could engineer a living shoreline here, but is it suitable given the trade-offs that might occur with other natural resources and in some cases other built resources? Um, I, I, I don't want to speak for what VMRC needs to see in the application to know that they've started down that process, but I, I certainly think it's a process. Um, and, and if you start with the first of those bullets that, that Rachel had up and incorporate uh, the information from the, from the agencies and the tools that, that, that are available, um, there, there may still need to be some site specific tweaks to it or, or separate evaluations, but um, I guess from my point of view, and I'm not the one in charge of the permits or the application or the, uh, is sometimes it's a process to get to that point. But that's probably better for Randy or Rachel to, to fully comment on. I'll jump, I'll jump in there. Um, for the wetlands, so wetlands boards are gonna be different um, in their review processes, but what's important is that when making the decision, it's on record that that these suitabilities, uh, the tools, they were reviewed and why or why not the decision was, was made. So that's what's important is that during that public or during that review process, uh, we, can, we can see that um, the following things were reviewed and this is why it has been determined that a particular thing is not suitable. Well, as expected, there are a lot of other questions and we may have some more time at the end, but for the sake of the other panelists, we'd like to move on. Thank you all of, to all of you. But for now, I'd like to introduce our next panelist who is Justin Williams. Justin is with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. He directs the Office of Watersheds and Local Government Assistance. He is going to um, talk about the climate adaptation amendment to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act designation and management regulation. And this amendment provides clarity that climate change adaptation and resilience measures are a permitted activity within the Chesapeake Bay preservation areas. So it looks like your screen sharing is good to go, Justin. So I'm Justin Williams. I am the director of the Office of Watersheds and Local Government Assistance at BEQ, and I want to talk about the climate adaptation amendment to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area Designation and Management Regulation. Talk a little bit of the uh, background and then provide an overview of the amendment uh, related to climate adaptation, the various sections and provisions in those amendments, and then the next steps, which you heard a little bit about from Rachel in terms of some of the guidance development we're doing, but talk about some of the other efforts that Pam and Elizabeth will also speak to later. So as Rachel indicated in her presentation, and as you can see here, there is obviously overlap that you run into between the various little lighting lines of the jurisdictions between 
uh, wetlands and Chesapeake Bay preservation area types. Um, as you see in this, um, uh, as you see here, we have two primary types of Chesapeake Bay preservation areas. That includes the resource protection area, which is the RPA feature plus the 100 foot buffer. And that's really primarily where you see uh, most of the conditions and focus within the CDPA program is on that resource protection area. We do also have resource management areas, which are adjacent lands um, that by virtue of their characteristics or designation also could have an impact to the RPA based on water flow or, or other features. Under the existing uh, CDPA amendment uh, regulation, there are criteria that apply for activities in both the general performance um, criteria requirements that apply to all CDPA areas and then there's specific development criteria related to the resource protection areas. And the amendments for the climate adaptation uh, largely focus on the criteria and requirements within the resource protection area. These regulatory amendments were the result of a change in the actual statute for the criteria uh, that local governments are required to apply uh, to their local programs and require the State Water Control Board to develop that criteria. Um, it was done in the 2020 General Assembly session. And in doing, um, in, in undertaking that amendment, it specifically included climate resiliency, climate resilience and adaptation to sea level rise and climate change as one of the criteria. Uh, the proposed regulations were public notice February 1st to May 3rd. Um, Pursuant to the enactment clause for that statutory change, it was not subject to the Administrative Process Act, uh, but it did include some elements still, including public notice of the proposed regulations. And then based on the State Water Control Board's authorization, we also had a stakeholder advisory group that was pulled together and held meetings with that group May 13th and 14th to get additional feedback uh, prior to making the final amendment. Those amendments were adopted by the State Water Control Board at their June meeting. They will be then, uh, we're still waiting a publication of the final amendments in the Virginia Register. The regulatory amendments related to climate adaptation created a new section in the regulation. Um, that's 9 VAC um, 25-830-155. Uh, each of those sections touch on various elements are now required under the amendment uh, from general provisions to the conditions related to assessment of climate change and adaptation measures, a tie-in with the Title Wetlands Guidelines, and some limitations on the granting of exceptions. We did have amendments in other sections, specifically uh, these regulations and the way the program operates in the 84 Tidewater localities that are subject to the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act is that the effective um, implementation of the requirements come into play when they are adopted and incorporated by the locality into their ordinances and programs. And so this regulatory amendment provides a three-year time frame for the localities to incorporate these changes. So unlike other regulations or the Title Wetlands Guidelines, for example, although the regulations become effective in the CDPA red, uh, regulations, uh, they don't become on the ground effective until they are incorporated and adopted by the local government who implements the program. And there's a three-year time frame for localities to undertake that incorporation. We also amended um, sections um, related to definition to include definition of a nature-based solution and adaptation measure, which I'll talk about more when we talk about those provisions that were adopted related to adaptation measures. So the two primary elements that the uh, regulatory amendment accomplished is to one, address and incorporate consideration of climate change and its impacts into uh, evaluation of proposed land development in the resource protection area, as well as to provide allowances and conditions for the installation of adaptation measures um, to address the impacts of climate change or sea level rise, um, including um, potentially storm surge or increase or um, resilience recurrent flooding um, through certain specific conditions. So the first element is the assessment. Uh, it does provide that localities are to assess the impacts of climate change and sea level rise on proposed land development within the resource protection area. 
localities are to incorporate this as a part of their plan and development review process, which is the typical process localities utilize to evaluate any proposed development for the in line of the requirements of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act and their regulations. Uh, we did provide clarity and specificity because we are obviously looking at um, an assessment of the impacts and how that could uh, change even the RPA over time, that the actual assessment itself, though, is based upon the RPA as delineated at the time of the proposed development, it's not creating future RPAs or rolling RPAs. We did provide that the assessment should be based on looking at at least a 30-year time frame or the lifespan of the project if it happens to be less than 30 years, if it's more temporary in nature, or by virtue of the type of project, um, the lifespan is not expected to exceed that. And we did specify that it, the locality should use a model or forecast used or developed on behalf of the Commonwealth, and really that practically results in two current models or forecasts that are available, which are the Virginia Flood Risk Information System, which most localities are familiar with. Uh, because of the interplay with the floodplain analysis. Uh, that Virginia Flood Risk Information System does include all of the uh, potential scope of impact um, except for the storm surge. But you are able to see the sea level rise and apply the new intermediate curve in that model. Adapt Virginia, which was developed by them, is the primary model um, currently available to look at the scope of impact identified which they're look, required to look at sea level rise based on the 2017 NOAA Intermediate High Curve, which is the same standard that were identified in the Tidal Wellings Guidelines and have identified elsewhere um, by the state to look at storm surge using the NOAA SLOSH model and then to look at flooding uh, based upon the special uh, flood hazard area and the limit of moderate wave action. So essentially, the requirement is to look at this proposed land development in light of these potential impacts, um, specifically those impacts identified in the regulation utilizing that model or forecast. This is an example of the ADAPT Virginia model and the information that is provided where it incorporates those um, specific scopes and data or information that is available to be um, looked at within the model. So you see here, Sea level rise as it's projected out 20 years in 2050 in a particular area and providing specifics on the anticipated mean high water intermediate high scenario for an area. Based upon the uh, assessment, it is to be done to look at those impacts in light of the proposed development and particularly, of course, um, given the emphasis of the RPA and the regulations on the buffer function. As a result of that assessment, uh, or included in that assessment, is the identification of conditions, alterations, or adaptation measures that may be unnecessary or appropriate in light of that assessment and evaluation of those impacts. Uh, we did include an allowance for this assessment to be part of the water quality impact assessment, which is a current requirement under regulations when there is proposed development in a resource protection area, that there is a water quality impact assessment. And typically, localities um, require this assessment to specify forms to be submitted by the applicant. So this would be allowed to be included um, as a part of that uh, form and assessment process as well. And of course, gives the localities that uh, authority to act based upon the results of that assessment to include and require conditions, alterations, or adaptation measures as necessary and appropriate. The next uh, major element of the, of the regulatory amendments are the allowance for adaptation measures and providing specifics around uh, when those may be utilized in the resource protection area. Uh, the regulation does require that it be a nature-based solution and that it is a specified type of recognized uh, measure within a specified universe. Uh, that includes Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership BMP, a Virginia Stormwater BMP, a shoreline protection strategy, which is outlined, um, as you heard about earlier in the Title I guidelines, or an eligible activity for funding by the Virginia Community Flood Preparedness Fund. Um, so if it's a nature-based solution and specifically recognized within one of those categories, it is allowed unilaterally uh, within the RPA uh, as an adaptation measure along with other requirements. Obviously, to be designed, installed, and maintained in accordance with any of the specifications 
um, tied to that source and that was identified. It, as always, it requires the preservation and existing natural vegetation to the maximum extent for maximizing that element and minimizing any land disturbance with this installation. And of course, that it complies with any local, state, or federal law or requirements otherwise. We did specifically address for the allowance for the use of fill and um, in its connection with adaptation measures. Um, that requires specifically that there is um, grading and sloping that is addressed consistent with the project specifications, um, that the use of the fill supports the growth of adaptation, that any stormwater runoff that may be created through the um, use of fill is addressed and managed, that there's not a negative impact of septic systems and drain fills from the use of fill, and that it's consistent with any additional requirements at the federal and state level. That does include the floodplain management requirements because there are specific elements um, and restrictions in the floodplain management regulations uh, at the federal level in terms of the use of fill. And so we did want to ensure that there was a connection there to those requirements. We also uh, did provide for limitations in the recognition or allowance of adaptation measures uh, such that localities are not required to allow or approve an adaptation measure in contravention of the natural National Flood Insurance Program or their established floodplain ordinances or in contravention of their participation in the National Flood Insurance Program Community Rating System. And obviously there is an interplay, um, as I think was a question with regards to the, to the Title Wetland Guidelines between some of this work and any of those requirements, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't creating or requiring localities to act in contravention of that. Uh, consistent with the Title Wetland Guidelines, uh, we wanted to ensure that we allowed adaptation measures that were nature-based and specifically identified, and we did not want to create an inconsistency with those guidelines that, of course, have a living shoreline as a default. Consistent with the guidelines, there is a recognition that in some instances, um, something other than a living shoreline, including a hardened shoreline project, may be necessary uh, for the site and that even where that does occur, it should be placed more landward. So we did maintain the existing provision for shoreline erosion control uh, measures, but recognizing a uh, reconciliation between that where you have to meet the requirements um, for that alternative uh, consistent with the title guidelines for that to separately, separately be allowed under that provision. We did provide limitations on uh, the granting of exceptions in general and to the uh, RPA development criteria, uh, specifically where climate change and sea level rise assessment has not occurred or the use of fill or and an adaptation measures and contravention of the requirements. So that puts a limitation on any exceptions that may be granted um, to any of the RPA development criteria um, otherwise. So Pam and Elizabeth will be talking a little bit more about this effort, but we obviously are going to be now engaging in additional guidance development. We were able, even prior to um, moving forward with the amendments to secure funding, to engage them on guidance development. There will be technical guidance and training that uh, will be pulled together as a part of that and include additional stakeholder engagement and public participation. Um, and again, Pam and Elizabeth will speak more on that. And as you heard with, uh, from Rachel, we are also separately planning uh, to move forward with a joint guidance with the MRC because we do recognize the interplay and overlap um, and want to make sure that we can provide clarity um, to localities and others who are dealing with both the CBPA requirements and those guidelines as to how those work together. And we're also going to try to identify additional opportunities for guidance development and technical assistance for localities as they move forward uh, with incorporation over the next three years. And I will stop there for questions. Thank you, Justin. One question we have for you is, can local governments begin reviewing adaptation projects before formally amending their CBPA ordinance if we act according to the new state regulations? So in order to do that now and recognize an adaptation measure, it would have to go through an exception process because that's not unless it somehow is connected to another allowance, for example, 
like the erosion shore, shoreline erosion control project or um, provisions related to larger scale watershed um, stormwater management projects, um, it would have to go through the exception process prior to being adopted and incorporated by a locality. Uh, but certainly, uh, we work with localities to provide technical assistance and answer questions. So if a locality has someone who wants to propose a measure, um, encourage them to reach out and um, engage with us on a specific ask if one comes in to look at one of these adaptation measures. Can you speak briefly about the locality liaisons? Yes, yeah, so within the office, we have currently four liaisons who each are assigned localities uh, within the um, 84 Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act applicable localities, which are the cities, counties, and towns essentially east of I-95. Um, those individuals and the contact is available on our website, but it's Amber Foster, Daniel Moore, Van Lasseter, and Heather Mackey, and they're each assigned localities that they not only help with technical assistance, but also conduct the program reviews. So we're more than willing and um, able to reach out and engage if localities have specific questions on a specific measure or request that they received. Another question we received earlier was about um, adjacent properties and the, the question of sea level rise adaptation. So this is, these regulations and guidelines are applied on a parcel by parcel basis, is that correct? So if neighbors don't sort of join in, then they will still have issues maybe coming from the sides of the properties, is that correct? Correct, so our particular regulations apply where there's proposed land development within an RPA, which be, would be at a parcel level. I think, though, certainly you see at a larger Commonwealth effort uh, to engage localities and planning district commissions on looking at climate adaptation and resiliency at a larger scale. And I think that's certainly uh, where the Commonwealth is encouraging engaging separately on trying to help deal with that particular issue as it relates to uh, the kind of culmination effect. Uh, but our regulations, uh, just by their nature, do apply on a parcel specific. Basis. And I will add that the VMRC wetlands um, guidelines um, and, and the code is the same, so it's on a parcel specific basis. And, and the guidelines do say that one of the things to consider in suitability of a project is the adjoining properties. Thank you for that clarification. I see another question for you, Justin. Um, do you see these new changes possibly changing any guidance as provided in your riparian buffer guidance manual, possibly altering mitigation plantings? I think absolutely. I think uh, we are, as I mentioned, and Pam and Elizabeth will talk about some of the separate guidance development um, that we'll be working on to actually fill in uh, additions on the implementation piece, which will speak specifically to um, some of the existing guidance as it relates to the buffer manual. Um, additionally, uh, we will have a separate effort to update the buffer manual specifically because of the other regulatory amendments that occur currently related to the preservation and planting of trees. And so ultimately our goal is to help recognize and, and reconcile that um, not only separately through new guidance, but existing guidance. And I think that part of the assessment is to recognize that there may be, by virtue of the assessment of those impacts, uh, require some sort of condition or alteration, which could include um, different things, uh, including additional mitigation or separate mitigation. So I don't see any other specific questions for Justin. Um, I think the, the guidance clearly is an important piece of this and the, the local governments that are going to need to change the regulations are, are going to be sort of working on this over the next three years. Is that correct, Justin? That's how the time frame that they have for that? Correct. So it's three years for adoption and incorporation, which would include into their ordinances with the existing CDPA requirements. And another question that we have again about adjacent parcels, um, what information analysis or analyses go into assessing the effects on adjacent properties? Um, the, the Corps of Engineers looks at this with shoreline stabilizations and it, and it is a struggle um, sort of looking at effects of activities on one parcel 
and how they might affect adjacent properties? Well, I think in particular to our requirements, um, that would come into play as one of the conditions for the use of fill is looking at and managing any potential stormwater runoff created through um, uh, through that use. And I think that's certainly part of what we'll be looking at to provide additional guidance on um, through that implementation uh, piece of that, you know, as well as um, as we typically do in the Buckler Manual now, for example, provide information on, on recommendations or conditions uh, to help um, ensure appropriate flow and, and mitigation. And then I'll answer from a VMRC's perspective. Um, the guidelines do say that um, things to consider are changes in hydrodynamics. Um, so if there is a project that is large enough that we need technical assistance to actually determine if, it, if this project is going to change the hydrodynamics of the area, um, we have Virginia Institute of Marine Science there to help with that. We've had we had some large breakwater structures um, with a similar pro with a similar issue a few years ago, and and had to determine whether those structures were actually going to impact you know the neighbors. So um, that would be something that we would go through all of our options, and if we got to a place where we needed additional technical guidance, we would um, ask Dr. Lukenbach and his team to to help us out. So we have to go back to this uh, process question, Justin, because I think there's some confusion. There's a couple of questions about the three-year time frame. Um, so during the three years, does local governments are not required to use the latest regulations? Um, are they are the regulations already in place or not until final publication? And then another question is about will there be a model ordinance provided for local yeah. governments to use? So they don't. They do not become effective in our regulations until after a period of time after publication, which they have not been published. So they are not final and effective yet in our regulation. The way our regulations in the program is set up, though, is our requirements don't apply independently to parcels or to proposals. That is all implemented at the local level. So that would not come into play until the local government adopts and incorporates those requirements. And that's where the three-year time frame comes into play because certainly that can not only um, take a process whereas we want to develop additional guidance and provide training, but obviously those are processes required at the local government um, to actually amend ordinances and incorporate it. So it would not become effective at the local government level and apply to a parcel or to a proposal until it's adopted and incorporated by the local government. And that... Um, so while it will exist in the regulation by virtue of that three-year time frame, it does not have a practical implication for a parcel or a proposal review until a locality adopts and incorporates it into the program. And that's the framework that's established generally for, for the CBPA. Uh, with regards to a model ordinance, I think that is part of the package of guidance and tool development that we want to look at uh, being able to provide. And certainly, um, we're going to look at uh, as many opportunities as we as we can based on resources and timing to provide tools and training for localities as, as they move forward with adoption. Great. Well, I, I think this is just the beginning of this information and we look forward to offering more information sources and references in the future. But since the guidance seems to be an important piece of it, um, Pam, if you're ready, if you would like to join us Pam, Pam is the Extension Manager at the VIM Center for Coastal Resources Management, and she has been involved with a lot of projects like this. And she also chairs the Chesapeake Bay Program Wetland Work Group that's facilitating efforts to protect, restore, and enhance tidal and non-tidal wetlands across the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So not only is Pam working on integrating along tidal shorelines management efforts, but also between tidal and non-tidal wetlands. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um... So I'm going to I'm going to do something <laughs> as I often do on these um, presentations is and start with now for something completely different. So we've had lots of conversation about regulations and guidance. And um, while obviously that is a is the envelope in which um, I'm going to be speaking today, I'm also going to be specifically dealing with some of the modeling um, that is going to help inform the guidance for the regulation that Justin just reviewed on the Chesapeake Bay um, Preservation Act. 
And I'm actually going to be speaking with this um, along with Elizabeth. And I should have put her name on here, but I have her at the end. So, so no worries. Um, so just break this down really quickly. So um, the folks at CCRM and um, I'm leading the responsibility for the folks at CCRM are focusing on the modeling. So we're, we're leading the modeling effort of this. Um, and VCPC is le leading the guidance effort. And then we're both supporting each other in this process. And so we're basically working together as a team. Um, the idea being that um, we were supposed to focus on looking at how flooded adaptation measures might affect um, water quality. And with that, um, within the context of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act um, regulation. So the focus at CCRM is on modeling the effects of the adaptations on model, modeling water quality, our measures on water quality and our modeling is underway. And we're also going to be doing some scenario development. And then that modeling effort is going to inform the guidance step. And so the guidance step is going to be, as it's been mentioned before, and we'll, we'll talk about it again, um, initiated sometime this fall and um, we'll then go to some sort of closure for guidance development at some time frame, probably in 2022. Um, the, the sort of slight uncertainty there is that we have two different processes in place. One is to actually develop the guidance to support the regulation. But the other piece is that some of the work that we're doing actually is also being supported by a no grant project of special merit, which specifically has an end date of March, 2022 although we may end up needing an extension for that. So that's why the time frame for some of this is a little bit different than the time frame for the guidance, which is the big overall umbrella under which we're working. So um, I'm gonna go more, as I said, more detail into the modeling and the forecasts, um, specifically talking about flood protection measure effects on water quality. So as Justin mentioned, we're working for a target date of 2025. Um, and this shouldn't say research, it's say resource protection area. Oh, sorry, I have an error right there. Um, for projections for the resource protection area features and buffer for 2025. And we're uh, not seeing you change your slides if you're changing your slides. Uh -oh. So this is the slide where I was sort of talking about the fact that CCRM is focusing on the modeling part of this. Um, and the modeling is intended to inform the guidance. Um, and then the guidance um, effort is actually going to be um, led by VCPC, but we are both working together. And as I said, this work um, is also part of a funded grant um, from NOAA as a project of special merit, which is being managed by um, the Coastal Zone Management Program in Virginia. So that's, again, over that overview. So, and the steps, and this is where I have my mistake. It says research protection area instead of resource protection area. Um, and I actually had these slides reviewed, so that got past three scientists. Um, and the analysis of those modifications of, of an analysis of modifications that may be made now or in the near future on the 2050 conditions. And so that's our format for our uh, model moving forward. So just drilling down a little bit more. So the, the, the future location of resource protection area features. So obviously the focus here is tidal wetlands non-tidal adjacent wetlands, and then the landward 100-foot RPA buffer. The, the date we're shooting for, again, is 2050. Uh, we're using the sea level, sea level rise curve for the INOAA intermediate high. So those are all specified in the regulation. So how are we doing this? So we're de actually developing what we're calling footprints. So we have, um, we're developing two footprints. One is sort of the, the, the universe of possibilities where all tidal marsh moves landward um, in response to sea level rise. And the second one is where tidal marsh migration landward is limited by existing management choices and or then we will run future scenarios for future management choices. So where we start, we start with the model location for mean high water. So this information has already been generated. Um, it is what it is the data that is served in ADAPT Virginia. So Rachel showed a slide. That information is comes from a, a very um, um, spatially explicit hydrodynamic model with the sea level rise curves built into it. 
then we need to adjust for the one and a half times the tide range to find the upper limit of tidal wetlands, the legal jurisdictional upper limit. Then we need to add non-tidal wetlands, landward of that, wherever they exist. And then finally, we need to place the RPA 100 foot buffer. So for the tidal wetlands, we do have um, our tidal marsh, marsh inventory from CCRM for where they are currently. So we are using that data as our starting point. For non-tidal wetlands, we are using um, the National Wetlands Inventory, and we're actually then joining those two data sets together so that we can look at wetlands at, with a capital W. So in other words, all wetlands, tidal and non-tidal adjacent. So this is um, a, a, an image of the present and future RPA features and buffer. And so it just is an explanation of, of what I was trying to say in words, but now we can look at it visually. So um, we basically have the black line is the current shoreline. Um, so this is an approximate location of mean tide or mean low water. Um, and then the purple line is the estimated mean high water location for 2050. So you can see, um, sorry, the, the, I misspoke, the blue line. So this line here is the mean high water for 2050. And then the purple is the estimated jurisdictional upland wetland boundary. So this would be, as I said, all tidal marsh plus adjacent. So in this case, um, we, are, we are showing you whether that adjacent NWI or national wetlands, non-tidal um, wetland is forested or scrub shrub. Um, we don't necessarily have to keep those separately, but that's just how we're, di we're showing it in this particular example. So you can see where mean high water would be and then wetlands and then adjacent um, non-tidal wetlands. To continue the explanation of the protocol for delineating the current buffer, so um, we have the 100 foot buffer, which is pink. And so along the shoreline without wetlands, it's just a buffer and then inland of tidal wetlands where there are any. So you can see again, the dark green and tan polygons here are contiguous to shoreline, in this case shoreline meaning tidal wetlands. And so the buffer goes landward of those. So these are NWI wetlands adjacent to tidal wetlands. Um, I would note that in this case, the way we do our analysis, the buffer buffers both sides of the line. Obviously, when we go forward, this data, we will be, we're just now in the process of producing these footprints. This data will be cleaned. So the inside, the waterward side will obviously not be part of the buffer. It's just part of the model data um, as the GIS output. So hopefully that's not, not too confusing. Um, and again, the green and tan polygons are wetlands and the blue is the water. So then the, the next step is developing, um, we're gonna develop two footprints from that. So the first one is where um, all the, the 2050 RPA using the estimated 2050 mean sea level, mean high water, and the upper limits of tidal wetlands. And the reason that those matter is because in order for us to find the one and a half times the tide range, we have to know where mean sea level is and mean high water, because then we have to project, we have to calculate that difference. <clears throat> and it turns out that um, it's very interesting that for the 2050 timeline, it's 1.5 meters, which is sort of interesting because it's one and a half times the tide range, and that will end up being 1.5 meters. Um, for, for much of Virginia. Now, understandably, <clears throat> we understand that the tide range is slightly variable throughout coastal Virginia. Um, however, um, several studies, including some of the work that's been done here by Molly, Dr. Molly Mitchell and some others, have found that, that we can separate that data slightly. So for the, you know, the upper ends of some of our tidal reaches where the tide range is a little higher versus the bayfront where it's a little lower, but statistically, it ends up being that our mode or our median still ends up being around the same. So we're using one set of data for this. Um, so the footprint one assumes that everything at an elevation below the upper limit of tidal wetlands either is, becomes inundated, so it goes underwater or becomes wetlands. And then again, the RPA buffer, which is showing the inside of the buffer, but we want to focus on the outside of the buffer. Um, so in this case, all this pale orange, I would call it peach. Hopefully that's the color that you can see is the land um, below an elevation where the buffer is. And then again, pointing out that the green polygons are um, non-tidal adjacent wetlands, so the buffer goes around those as well. So footprint two, 
So this is the one that really we will probably end up doing mostly analysis on, but we just needed to have a baseline. Footprint one is basically our baseline. Footprint two is a multi-step approach to look for the presence or absence of tidal wetlands along the shoreline. So if the tidal wetlands aren't present, then the 2050 shoreline, um, the RPA would be drawn right from there. So you can see there's some red polygons where there are no existing wetlands um, along the shoreline. So what will happen is the buffer will just go landward of that. However, for um, if tidal wetlands are present, so some of these green boxes, the RPA will be drawn landward of the non, of the non-tidal wetlands, unless, of course, there's contiguous. Sorry, the RPA will be drawn landward of the tidal wetlands unless there are contiguous non-tidal wetlands. In which case, again, the RPA goes around them. And how we're doing this is an analytical process called Thiessen polygons. And it's a method of equally dividing the shoreline and land associated within a shoreline reach. So you can see it cuts the shoreline up into these little polygons. And then what we're able to do is um, use the polygons and hydrographic flow lines to see where the wetlands from today would be in 202050. So this is really our, our wetland location projection piece, which is the critical part, obviously, of finding then the RPA buffer. So now you can see under this footprint two, where we have the hydrographic flow lines. And so you can see that we wanted to know whether the wetlands are connected by, by surface water, because that's the definition for um, non-tidal adjacent connected wetlands. And so we could see where the, where the wetlands, um, tidal wetlands and non-tidal wetlands are connected to each other. And that allows us to look for where the wetland extent would be for um, 2050 under, um, <clears throat> under uh, in the intermediate high sea level rise curve. So this is what that looks like. Um, what we've done is you can see that, and again, ignore the inside buffer on these um, because these slides were just made two days ago. So um, the, you can see that where the buffer, where there are no wetlands, which is the red stuff, the buffer just goes in from where the red would be. Now, in these cases, this buffer is actually going out further because you can see these migrated wetlands. So what you end up having is the pale green is the extent for tidal and non-tidal connected wetlands for 2050 under the immediate high curve, and then the buffer goes behind that. So where are we gonna go with all this? Um, we are just in the process of finishing up the footprint two, which is the one that we then want to build scenarios on. So once we know where the wetlands are projected to be, we know where the shoreline is today, we want to work with um, the steering committee and or technical advisory group to review scenarios for management options, things like would all lands be below a certain elevation be managed? In other words, would there be something in place or put on the ground that would prevent those wetlands from moving, which would obviously then change water quality um, provision, service provision? Would there be only certain land covers that would be managed? Like for instance, would changes only be allowed possibly in turf grass, but not in natural land covers. And so if we were to take <clears throat> the data output from um, our attributes on that model and then change those attributes based on what we thought today's management or current time management would be. And then we would develop the scenarios um, and then the analyses based on that. So um, at this point, I wanted to um, switch over to Elizabeth to talk a little bit more about the context and the stakeholder piece of it. And Elizabeth Andrews is the director of the William and Mary Law School's Virginia Coastal Policy Center. And her staff and law students work with a variety of coastal stakeholders to integrate the latest science with legal and policy analyses to solve resource management issues. She also serves as Virginia's representative um, to the Chesapeake Bay Program's <clears throat> Climate Resiliency Work Group. And she was also appointed by Virginia's Governor Northam to the uh, Technical Advisory Committee for Virginia's Coastal Resilience Master Plan. Um, Elizabeth is currently working, as Pam said, with her on the development of the Integrated Shoreline Management Guidance for Virginia. So Elizabeth, we look forward to see how the legal and policy piece of this fits in. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, really quickly, Pam, before I, I jump into what I'm gonna talk about, I did wanna make sure you saw the note from Bruce in the chat box that, 
he presumes he realized the National Wetlands Inventory fails to delineate significant acres of non-tidal wetlands. I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that. I think Karen responded. Yeah, Karen did respond. Um, yeah, actually, we at CCRM have been involved for over 25 years working with NWI, actually did some of the original field verifications. So we are aware of some of the limitations. Um, it's especially problematic in what we call hardwood mineral flats, if people still know what that term means. But basically, uh, outer coastal plain, no slope, um, groundwater fed wetlands, um, which sometimes are the ones that are adjacent to tidal wetlands. Um, however, I do think that on the shoreline, right along the shoreline, sometimes it's a little bit, the data set's sometimes a little bit better than it is on the interior section. So thank you for that observation. Great. So as um, Pam noted, I am not gonna use PowerPoint slides with you all this morning, um, the change of pace. You have to just boringly enough hear from me. I've been asked to take a step back and, and a little bit of a bigger picture uh, discussion. Um, and I wanna note that we've made some great progress in Virginia, right? We've got the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act that the General Assembly, a traditionally long-term water quality program, the General Assembly has recognized the need to consider climate change as part of that. The Living Shorelines mandate for Virginia, uh, rather than just preference. Um, the joint DEQ VMRC guidance that Justin mentioned that they plan to develop. The Virginia Master Plan, uh, we're coming into the finish line on the first iteration of that this fall, and that's exciting. Um, funding for the local level uh, through the Community Flood Preparedness Fund, the, the Reggie Auction Proceed Dollars, that's an exciting development. To be blunt, there has just not been money for the local level uh, to deal with resilience issues, and that's where the local government and the local uh, staffs, they're all in the crosshairs on this issue. So that's a very welcome development. Not enough funding, but it's a start. Um, but we still have work to be done. Um, integration of our programs, we're still working on that, obviously. Training for local government, as I mentioned, the ones in the crosshairs, they, we need to provide more training opportunities like this. Thank you, Vims. Um, incorporation of climate change impacts into our regulatory programs still needs work. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And then, of course, show me the money, the funding. Um, I, I chair the finance subcommittee for the master plan development effort. And one thing that is just the clearest lesson is there's just not enough money and we've got to figure out how to layer our different sources and work well with those. So uh, that said, I'm going to just start off with a quick discussion of the need and the legal implications for addressing climate change impacts across jurisdictional boundaries. Many people don't realize how unusual Virginia is because we have independent cities separate from our surrounding counties. Um, outside of Virginia, there are actually only three other cities like that, separate from the surrounding counties. Um, Carson City, Nevada, St. Louis, Missouri, and um, Baltimore, Maryland, in case you want that for a fun cocktail party fact. Uh, we have 41 of them. And that means each city and county has a separate comprehensive plan, separate ordinances, separate and different legislative authorizations. And in a Dillon rule state, that matters where localities have the authority that's given to them by the state legislature. Um, separate capital improvement plans, separate bonding capacity. And that last one is in particular important as we're trying to undertake expensive resilience projects at the local level. So all of that is important to keep in mind that it kind of hampers efforts at regional planning for resilience, um, but regional hazard mitigation plans that are put together by our planning district commissions are an excellent step in the right direction for that. Um, and frankly, the separate municipal charters even give the cities different and distinct authorities from each other. For example, Norfolk, when they developed their very progressive zoning ordinance, they noted in the beginning of it, um, building a better Norfolk, they noted in the beginning of it that um, they relied in part upon the authority that they have through their city charter in order to do that. So that may not be fully authority available to other cities that don't have the same charter. Um, another legal consideration to keep in mind as we try to grapple with climate change impacts is our shifting property lines. We are a mean low water state. That's the designated delineation between the riparian upland owner and the Commonwealth owned bottomland. And that will shift with sea level rise and um, events, that storm events and erosion, et cetera. Um, shifting sometimes public access to beaches, uh, shifting public trust uh, doctrine application to property and shifting the resource protection area under the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, as Pam was just showing us how they're planning to grapple with that. Uh, all of that is a challenge for local government planning for uh, areas for upland migration of marshes, for example, and areas for development 
and safe areas for their communities. So that's another challenge in our resilience efforts. And then also the sea level rise um, impacts also mean that areas of private property that are not regulated wetlands today can become so, which can often take property owners by surprise. So all of those are things that we need to keep in mind as we try to integrate our programs and incorporate climate change resilience into them. So um, climate change impacts, some of the implications for, for Virginia's regulatory programs. Uh, first of all, stormwater management is an obvious one. We did a paper, uh, one of my students, Samantha Becker did a paper for us back a couple years ago that's on our website, talking about this need to balance our water quality programs and our um, need to address climate change impacts and flooding. Um, we are seeing increased precipitation, stronger precipitation events, and we have, in some cases, older stormwater infrastructure that just can't handle it. And we have a grad rising groundwater table in many areas. And so those things really are factors that come into play. Uh, for example, in uh, Hurricane Matthew, it didn't even make landfall in Virginia, and yet it inundated and overwhelmed stormwater systems in parts of Virginia Beach um, that are older systems that were already full of water from a prior tropical storm. So we need to look at our infrastructure and our requirements for dealing with precipitation events. Um, it's not just hurricane events though, it's also um, increasing unnamed storm events, strong events, such as in Louisiana. Um, they had a few years back, a, a rainstorm unnamed that hovered for five days and it blew out their rivers and it blew out their stormwater infrastructure. So we need to be able to handle all of these types of uh, increased floodwater events. So a seasonal high groundwater table and the amount of impervious cover in an area, both can have an impact on uh, how much flood water, stormwater runoff it can deal with. And so those are things that we need to take into account because what we don't want as um, these practices can become less effective in some areas, some BMPs, some best management practices won't work in a high groundwater table area as well. DEQ did a couple of reports on that back in 2015 and 2016 at the request of the General Assembly. And I would encourage you to take a look at those on the legislative services system. But what you don't want is when there are fewer BMP alternatives available that work well in a high groundwater table area, um, you don't want the developers resorting to removing trees and grading sites to create topography to retain stormwater on site and then decrease the flooding resiliency of the site. So these are things we need to take into account as we work on these programs and integrate them more into the future. Um, and as existing measures may no longer be adequate, which could result in increased flood water, um, we need to look at our public manuals, stormwater design manuals. The city of Virginia Beach did that. They hired Dewberry, they went back and they looked at the actual rainfall frequency and intensity at the airport where they had some good records of, from the rain gauges over the past 70 years. And they did find that there was actually an increase in the, in the rainfall and they changed their stormwater design manual. So other Virginia localities and the Commonwealth as a whole may need to consider similar changes. In Maryland, they actually have um, in their stormwater program allowances for geographical differences and specific site designs. And so maybe we need to, as a Commonwealth, look to the programs of other states and programs that take into account regional differences in hydrology to get a more flexible approach. Um, and we need to update our regulations to reflect the newly updated rainfall um, precipitation frequency data from NOAA for the Atlas 14. So these are all things that were, it's on the horizon, it's the next step of things we need to look at. So we're encouraged that the Bay program now does address climate change through this legislative amendment and the regulatory amendments, and um, that they're made consistent with the VMRC wetlands guidance. And as localities are looking at measures to increase resilience in their coastal communities, um, they need to, and, and that's gonna include, by the way, hard armoring of some areas, we recognize that, and other properties may be um, becoming flood buffers as they're abandoned. It's important to ensure that these regulatory amendments are complied with. But one issue is that the resource protection area, the RPA is still only delineated at the time of development. It is not, an automatically rolling easement set forth in the law. So some property owners will still be taken by surprise probably by the change, as I mentioned earlier in the RPA delineation. Um, the regulatory amendments, as Justin noted, do say that adaptation efforts um, in the RPA must be compliant with floodplain management regulations. So there's coordination there. But on a slightly different note, sometimes uh, the CBPA regulations 
could come into play when a homeowner receives a FEMA grant to make their property more resilient, for example, to elevate their property. And perhaps they have to build a new means of access to get into the property, a ramp of some kind that might uh, intrude into the RPA. We recognize that's the kind of thing that may need to be addressed through the guidance or through localities, um, a special exception process. Justin noted that section 155B of the new regulations, the assessment of the impacts of a proposed development on the buffers functions, that does give local governments authority to act based on that assessment. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're gonna to have to discuss and figure out how uh, local government can best address them. And local governments will need to be making decisions based on these assessments. Um, Another note is that the section 155C of the new regulatory amendments only allow fill if it won't negatively impact septic systems and drain fields. Um, the increasing flooding that we're seeing and the rising groundwater table is causing more and more problems for septic in our rural areas. Um, unfortunately, I often say that I think it's septic is what's gonna get us before the actual flooding of homes because it's gonna drive some people out of their homes. And, um, so we need to look at our septic regulations and the clearance that we're requiring above the groundwater table in some areas. And then finally, living shorelines. Rachel did such a great job of outlining their new guidance and uh, new guidelines and that note that issuing a wetlands permit does not negate the need for compliance with the Bay Act and regulations to promote coastal resilience. Again, an integrated program is the goal so that we're working well together. Um, and there's more and more discussion about localities installing living shorelines in coastal areas um, that are set aside as flood buffers to help stop the erosion and stabilize the shoreline as the sea level rises. Again, these things can work together, flooding resilience and uh, habitat and shoreline erosion control. So really quickly, I just want to note for the actual guidance development process under for the Bay Act regulations, um, there was one stakeholders group meeting that was already held. DEQ held it already. There are two more stakeholder group meetings planned. Uh, the first one will be this fall. The technical, the technical group that Pam discussed, um, we're hoping to have a joint meeting with them or even merge them into the stakeholders advisory group. But on the whole, the guidance stakeholders group and the regulatory stakeholders group are the same. And the third meeting will not be until probably the new year post holidays, depending on how um, all of the work that Pam is doing and the stakeholder discussions progress. So I hope that was helpful. Just a quick overview. Are there any questions, Karen? Yes, yes, there are. One of the questions is just, is what you just ended with is to clarify that advisory group process. Um, if you mentioned it, I'm sorry, I missed it. Who, who's actually on that? Or are there other opportunities for public input to this process? I think that's probably, thank you, Justin appears. Well, I was gonna say this is probably best for Justin to say because DEQ is actually calling the membership of the group. Yeah, so we had the stakeholder advisory group that we pulled together for the regulatory amendment and we have checked in with those individuals to ask them to continue to participate. But uh, separating the part from the stakeholder advisory group, our guidance development does include public participation. So there would be opportunity for feedback and comment on any guidance that's developed prior to it being finalized as well. And if folks are interested in that process, I encourage you to reach out to me and Elizabeth and we can certainly share more, uh, plug you in with the information. And we will continue to share public notices and other opportunities for public input as we receive them at VIMS. We will share that back out with the entire shoreline management community. There was another question for Pam about the modeling. How easily will how easy will it be to update the model for different future years, or if NOAA changes their sea level rise projections? Um, so that's a great question that, as, as I um, said, that we start with the mean high water um, elevation is is the elevation that's projected from the um, from the NOAA curves. We do have um, already those projected um, locations for other than intermediate high. So so just FYI, if you're if you're looking at that Virginia or or um, one of our tools, you can 
see that location for just the intermediate curve or the intermediate low. So all of them were, were done, were run. So we have all those lines. So if they change the rate, um, what it will do is effectively just push it further inland. And so that would have to be, that data would have to be regenerated. Again, though, it would be regenerated probably for all the different rates if they were all changed. As far as changing the date, same thing. So we actually have and originally had offered um, to do those projections for years out of 2050. But because the regulations focus on 2050, that's where we are doing the work right now. So we actually have mean high water location for 2060, 2070, 2080, 2090, 2100. And so since we already have those mean high water locations, if we use the same thesis and polygons, yes, there is a bit of computer analytical time to it, but we do have the base data and that would be the most important piece of it. So it would be hard to predict exactly how long it would take, <clears throat> but we do have the pieces that we would need to start with. Okay, we have another question about property owners in general and how are they going to get information about the changes that might be made? I'm, I'm assuming this is a locality specific response that's going to be up to each locality to inform its citizens about changes to their amendments or regulations? Well, localities have a public input process for their ordinance adoption. But I see Justin has appeared magically again, so I don't want to preempt you, Justin, but, but they will have their own public input process, yes. So I hope, I hope that answers that question. And, and right now, you know, property owners can contact their local government officials and others for um, in their neighborhoods or communities for information about current situations and expectations of the current regulations. Um, another question we have is about the guidance. Will it address a situation in which a structure was built outside of the RPA, but at a later date is wholly within the RPA? What is their status? Will they be legally non-conforming? Well, I think that's probably going to be part of the discussion of the guidance development process about examples just like that. And the one I gave about, you know, what if you have a home that's elevated, even if the home itself's not in the buffer, what if the access becomes, the needed access becomes in the buffer? So there are going to be situations where a locality has a grandfathered in use, um, uh, pre-existing use, and the RPA has shifted to encompass it. Um, so that, that would be treated differently than new development, proposed development, which is what these regulations are are largely aimed at. I was just going to add that, that hopefully, uh, you know, we did, based on comments, include language that the assessment is based upon the RPA delineated at the time, just to avoid some of that um, confusion as to future rolling RPAs as well. So um, that to, to Elizabeth's point, it's about examining that assessment at a single point in time, if and when you've got some sort of proposed development as opposed to an existing structure where you would have a shift just naturally by virtue of, of uh, climate change. So Justin, just as a follow-up to that, because I've had people say to me, so the, the regulations say that it's as of the time of the proposed development that we're looking at the RPA, but VIMS is projecting out the RPA to 2050. So can you two maybe clarify a little bit about that again? Because that question comes up periodically. And I think that probably gets to the other question that was left about the, given the revision, what's the purpose? So we wanted to ensure from a regulatory basis that we weren't creating future RPAs or rolling RPAs. And so the way that this would work is someone would come in, let's say in 2025 uh, and say, I want to extend or expand a structure, install a structure, so forth in the RPA. So you would look at the RPA delineated at that time but the sea level rise and the future mapping is to be able to do the actual assessment piece as to what is going to be that shift and or how would that affect the, the proposed development. So it's not about recreating or creating a new RPA line so much as it is assessing those impacts in that context. I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, is the work that Pam's doing as well is not just to address the applicability of the regulations in terms of this assessment, but it's going to provide valuable information to localities for their future planning uh, 
efforts and looking at what these shifts are, are expected to be, you know, even if you know, if you don't have proposed development, having this analysis of where you're going to see these shifts in the future provides a great planning tool to locality. So I, I want to, I think, highlight that element of it as well. And Pam, if there's anything else or Elizabeth you want to add. Uh, yeah, so um, I'd like to, to add a little bit to that. Um, since this is all framed within the water quality, provision of water quality services, part of the, of the you know, regulation, because that's what it is. Um, I think it's important for us to understand where we think the tidal wetlands are going to be and then, and then the, the landward buffer behind that, because the buffer is in place to protect our RPA features. In other words, the waters of the state. And so if the waters of the state are gonna be 20 feet inland and then the buffer is gonna start there, what we need to know in order to inform um, decision-making about impacts or changes to that land and that landscape is, what is the land use land cover? So ultimately it comes down to are those practices, but is that land vegetated? So. So, for instance, if that buffer, um, like right now, let's say there's a single line of trees or a, a small chunk of trees, and then behind that is all lawn. So if somebody wanted to implement a practice, um, an adaptation measure, perhaps the trade-off would be fine, but then you have to vegetate what will be the land that will become your future buffer. In other words, so in order to maintain the provision of water quality practices over time into 2050, Knowing where that land, where the buffer is going to be, helps us to be able to inform that that discussion and that assessment, as, as Justin pointed out. So to make a bold attempt to summarize, uh, you use today's RPA delineation to determine whether or not these regulations apply to this project that's proposed. And then you look at the, you assess today's proposed development project to see what impact it will have on this buffer area into the future. Future wetlands and buffer location and, and cover. And the, uh, yeah, yes, and, the, uh, and I would say the actual impacts itself, meaning, you know, I think one of the practical implications, and we talked about this with the actual regadoc adoption, is you could have a proposed land development today that when you assess these impacts, there's no changes necessary, you know, by virtue of the nature of the proposal, or it could be significant. And I think the important thing is that it's assessed in light of those, those impacts. The other things I would, you know, note is just the practical implication of that, meaning if the proposed development is somewhere that's literally going to be underwater in 30 years, I think that's an important part of the consideration in the assessment as well, you know, when you're looking at that, um, because that may require a shift or a change down the road, which is going to impact the buffer again, and ultimately our goal is to minimize as much as possible, uh, not only changes or alterations or impacts to the buffer, but repeated impacts to the buffer as well. So Karen, if I could jump in and ask a question of Rachel, drag her back here to us again, because I saw a couple of questions that kind of tie in, you know, Justin saying, you want to see where, whether that parcel is going to be underwater 30 years from now, right? And there are a couple of questions in the chat box that are a little similar that say, well, do people really want to invest in a living shoreline if it's only going to be around for X years? So did you want to respond to that as well? Yeah. So one of the things that we need to start exploring more is how do we, de how do we develop a shoreline so that it adapts to sea level rise? Um, so right now we have a habit of building a lot of lower marsh um, and what we need to start considering with these guidelines, and, and I think the guidelines push us that way, is we can do living shorelines, but maybe they're just a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. And they're a little bit higher elevation, um, maybe as high elevation as we can actually make them so that they, they'll they still be there in 15 or 20 years. And I think that's the key part of, of this that we have to get better at for from a design perspective. Thanks. Sorry to jump in there, Karen. I just saw. Oh, no, no, that uh, takes us to. So if I might add to that, and something that um, has been part of the conversation, at least at CCRM for 20 years, is um, when we consider a living shoreline, we think cross shore zone. And so we think from below mean low water 
all the way up to the to an upland elevation. And and for instance, the the natural nature based features project we just finished actually looks at t a ten foot elevation. You know everything below that elevation. And so um, we the the to to accommodate a, a true living shoreline um, over time would involve having something on the back shore or the capacity to do something on the back shore and incorporate vegetation of that system so that it, it the system itself is resilient um, and provides those multiple benefits, but also itself can then change over time and persist at least as long as it's able to, you know, obviously not, they're not all going to persist. That's not going to happen. We know that. Um, but can we offset time a little bit and, and, you know, get more of our habitats in a, in a place where they might persist longer than they would without assistance. And Rachel, when you talk about more elevated, perhaps, as an example you gave, right? More elevated living shorelines, perhaps. So would the process be that the scientific aspects of a proposal would go to VIMS to look at the best available science, and then the engineering aspects would be reviewed by MRC? Is that the way that would work? So uh, if you're saying if someone applied for a living shoreline, there yeah, would be a lot of engineering work on it. Yeah. And, and it would. And, and I think that, you know, part of this process is that this is a more engineered way of looking at, this is a more technical way to stabilize shorelines and that it's going to take a little bit more technical expertise than maybe um, we said, it, we said that it used to. Um, I, I, would like to see, and hopefully some of our guidance in the future, and, and maybe it's already there, but I would like to see us or someone produce some guidance on how to build living shorelines with these new guidelines, um, you know, with these new guidelines in hand. So what are the things that designers need to be looking at um, with the 2017 curve? And does that mean we're building bigger sills or does that just mean we're doing our fill and our planting and our grading a little bit different? And this gets back to several questions we had earlier when Rachel and uh, Mark Lukenbach were talking about the engineering versus feasibility or suitability question. And, you know, there were a couple of questions about the distinction between the VIM scientific suitability and the engineering technical feasibility is a really important aspect. And um, the, the questioner is asking if there can be any more clarity or distinction about that. And I think, Rachel, you're right that there may be, need to be additional technical guidelines for living shoreline development that also address not only this landward migration issue, but also current regulatory concerns about changing subaqueous, shallow water, and aquatic habitat into terrestrial habitats. Absolutely. So there, there's definitely some balancing that will have to take place there. Does anybody want to speak to this sort of engineering versus suitability question anymore? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Okay. So we actually are doing some research um, here at CCRM to assess the um, efficiency and efficacy of certain engineering practices, especially some of the um, the reef issue, you know, so the incorporation of shellfish and, and the structures, um, you know, historically, um, we have been supportive of granite as, as an offshore structure construction material, largely because it's super dense, it's very angular, so it doesn't roll, it doesn't float, it, it, will, it will stay put in a big storm mostly. Okay, there are exceptions. Concrete, which is often commonly used, is a lot less dense and can, and can float and tumble a little easier. But what if you had some approach wherein there was some sort of combination or you were able to use the concrete and impregnate it with um, shell and then thereby also add another biotic element of like a shellfish element, right? So, so what are the trade-offs and the efficacy of that? And, and specifically from the erosion standpoint, right? So we've already talked about the co-benefits of habitat and that's something that we do a lot of research and Rachel has already pointed out a lot of that in a, in, in a book that was edited by um, some of the scientists here. But in terms of the actual efficacy of the structure doing what it's intended to do, 
um, as as erosion shoreline erosion protection. I would also point out that we have talked a lot um, in the past about the difference between shoreline erosion protection and flood abatement. And so those two things do not necessarily conflate. We need to be very aware of the fact that one may or may not provide the some co-benefits in the other space, but not necessarily. And so, um, you know, we do need to be mindful of if we want to, um, you know, prevent flooding um, or at least abate flooding, um, that things like living shorelines can participate in that from the extent that they will dampen and quiet waves. And so some of that wave and surge energy can be addressed. Larger systems like big marshes and big mangroves, where a lot of that work's been studied, do a lot better job at it. And so there's definitely a scale question. And so so we need to be mindful that we need that when we're looking at this and the science that's being done and the research that's being done around it, it might be looking at one or or the other of those elements, not always both. So just wanted to add that. And there's also the human element. There's been a couple of comments about the human response to these changes that are occurring on people's properties that they will very likely in many cases not appreciate or accept those changes and want to make adaptation activities to sort of draw the line and maybe outside of the current RPA buffer to prevent those future migrations. So I think our guidance has to be cognizant of the realities of the humans, right? And their the, the, the restrictions of that. There's a couple of questions about how the localities are going to implement this idea of acting within the current RPA boundary, but thinking into the future. So I think that as Elizabeth pointed out, that is going to certainly be an ongoing, current and ongoing challenge for the local governments. And another sort of comment here is that the local wetlands boards are still very limited in what they can require until their localities update by adopting new state, or like uh, by updating their own regulations, they're, they're still limited, but they do have the new Tata Wetlands guidelines that are in place now that the wetlands boards can be following and, and using, applying to current permit applications. But for the, the adjacent area, the outside of the wetlands board's jurisdiction, that is what is in the future regulation changes. Yeah. And, and, I guess one of the easier things about a wetland regulator is that we're the first part and that we know that wherever our wetlands are moving, they're moving into the CBPA process. So they're going to be protected if the CBPA is protecting them. But if, but right now the model ordinance is in the code as well as the guidelines are there. So those protections, those protections are there for any existing, existing wetlands where the guidelines are really asking us to look is, is when we design these projects to start thinking about how it's going to move in the future and to make sure we're using that in our consideration for review of projects. Well, we've run up against the noon hour and I realize that there are still some additional comments and questions to address. And we will try to compile some of these um, into a document that is posted on our website. And, um, I would like to start sharing my screen to just close out with a few comments in a couple minutes that we have left. Feedback about today's webinar is welcome, positive or otherwise. You can contact us via email at ccrminfo at vims.edu. That ends our webinar program for today. I wanna to thank all of the panelists again for their time and effort to contribute to today's program. I also wanna thank co-host Susanna for her assistance and an extra special thanks to all of you, the participants for tuning in today. Today's webinar recording, the presentations and related materials will be posted to a website for future reference. So thank you again, everyone. Stay well and have a wonderful day.